Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Jim Cobray. I'm going to go before the Lord. Father, we just thank you. We give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord, the house that you built. And how wonderful it is to be able to approach the throne of grace in the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're grateful people, Lord. But Lord, let's make it very clear. We have not come to hear from a man. We don't do that at this church. We don't come to hear from a young man. We don't come to hear from an old man. We don't come to hear from a a white man or brown man or black man. We haven't come to hear from a tall man or a short man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and in our lives today. But Lord, as you bless us, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would bless them. They're our brothers and sisters. And Lord, we do not want you just to bless us without blessing them. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. You know how many pastors, Father, I just read an article that 18,000 churches close every month in America because of discouraged pastors. I pray, God, that you would encourage their heart. I know this is tough. I know it's hard. But Lord, we're lifting them up, asking you to encourage them today. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Amen. We're going to take a sidestep from Hebrews. And by the way, Hebrews is such a wonderful text and such a wonderful understanding of the word of God. Uh, By no means do I celebrate the fact that we go somewhere else during this time of year, I celebrate Hebrews because it's brought us such wisdom and understanding. The depth of who God is, what God's done, and the depth of our hearts and who we are with God, the book of Hebrews has been exciting. But during the month of June, we're stepping aside so that we can properly do something. We can properly, once again, edify and build the church to understand the principles of what the Word of God is saying. Why? Because at times we need to be encouraged. This is one of my favorite subjects that we're going to be talking about today. It would sound and appear to many of you as if I'm talking about money and giving money. That would be a tragedy if you thought that. I am not talking about giving money. I'm talking about building your heart. This is never about giving money without a heart behind it. You see, God's not after your money. God's after your heart. And when he has your heart, he also has your money. And we've taught it the wrong way for years. So this is about building your character, your heart. Why? Because on June 21st and June 22nd, we're celebrating our 26th anniversary. We have a track record of 26 years of preaching the gospel, 26 years of a healthy ministry, 26 years of feeding the poor, 26 years of massive, and I'm talking massive missions outreach. This year alone, for an example, the entire month of October is set aside for missions outreach. And we'll have missionaries from all over the world. One of the greatest missionary evangelists on the planet will be teaching on a Wednesday night, Reinhard Bonnke, in this place. And it's going to be absolutely phenomenal what God is going to do in this church. And I'm proud to be part of what God is doing, just a little bit, and what he allows me the privilege of doing. But today we're talking about the heart. We're talking about the subject, of course, is freedom for our future. And really, it's freedom, as you see on the overheads, it's really a freedom of our hearts. 
Can we put the title up? Thank you. Freedom of the hearts. And so it's very important for us to realize this is not about money. It's really about your heart. Because without an understanding of that, you will miss what God has for your future. We talked about freedom for the generations. That's what we're doing. Is we're going to literally pay off this church in the next two years. We've done a great job in the first year. Got two years left. And I'm telling you, when we pay off the church, it means $86,000 every single month. How many people can we feed? How many buses can we buy? How many outreaches could we go for? How much missionaries around the world could be winning souls for Jesus Christ with $86,000? And it's so simple if we'll just all have a picture of the place that we have in doing what God would have us to do. It's so simple. So on the 21st, 22nd, we're going to have a great birthday celebration. Those that haven't made commitments, maybe you'd like to make a commitment. Those who have made a commitment and fulfilled it already, which is a lot of people, maybe you'd like to make a new commitment if you'd like. If not, we're just grateful for what you've done. And we're just excited about that very special offering to help us get to where God would have us to be. Freedom for the generations, so that it's not a one-generation church, but it keeps going and going and going. Maybe your children or your children's children will preach at one of the rock churches around the world someday. Wouldn't that be an exciting thing? I know this, that if your children come through our children's ministry, which is the best in the world, there's no way they're ever going to settle for anything but all of God. And so we, we better get ready for an explosion of these children. We also talked about freedom from financial institution. Why in the world do we have to have a financial institution telling us how we do things, when we do it, what to do, you know, and threaten us throughout the whole thing, even though you make your payments on time and you do things the right way. It's just always a pressure from the financial institutions that are taking that money every single month. Why is it that your tithe and your offering doesn't go, at least a portion of it, to the mission fields and feeding the people and taking care of people, it goes to a mortgage. We need to be free of that. And then thirdly, and I love this, freedom for more ministry. Like I said, how much could we do if we had that money? How many people could we save? How many people could get healed? How many people can know about Jesus and lives and marriages and children be changed? Oh my goodness, it's just the beginning because it's really wonderful. And if we understand the whole principle behind this, it's a wonderful understanding of the word of the Lord. Let me just share a verse with you. I'm going to put it up on the overhead. I want to point it out to you. It's Proverbs, the third chapter, starting with verse number nine. Notice how it highlighted. It says, honor the Lord. Let me just stop you right there. We can honor the Lord in a number of ways. You can honor the Lord by coming to church. You can honor the Lord, if you will, by singing a song. You can honor the Lord by carrying your Bible. You can honor the Lord by being a witness. You can honor the Lord by preaching the gospel. And you can honor the Lord with your lips, but he doesn't say that. He's talking about lifting God up. That's honor. Putting him in his right place. How do you do that? He says with this, with your, listen to these words, with your possessions. That and literally the stuff that you have, it is the desire of God for you to honor the Lord with what you have. And it's so important for us to see this. And then he says, and with the first fruit of all of your increase. So that when God increases you, guess what? You take a portion of that to increase the work of God and to honor the Lord. It can't be done out of a religious institution and a religious heart, a ceremonial ritual done by the traditions of men. It's got to be done from the depth of the heart in order for it to work as you need it to work on your behalf. Verse number nine is fascinating because it tells us what to do and how to really honor God. What he really just said there is put your money where your mouth is. And that's very difficult when people's hearts are tied to their wallet 
instead of tied to the one who saved them. It's very difficult when your heart is on the things you have instead of the one who has you. And when that happens, your heart becomes something that's tainted and doesn't work. So after he says verse number 9, here comes verse number 10. you got to get this. Listen to this. So, I love the words. In other words, I just told you to honor God, not just with your words and your mouth, but honor God with your possessions. And so something takes place, so that your barn will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. You say, what the heck does that mean? I don't have a barn that doesn't work. I don't have any cows. I don't have... See, in the days that this was written, what he just described is the richest man in town. In other words, he just said, I want you to be the Bill Gates of your community. You say, how do I get to be the Bill Gates? It's not a bad idea. How do I get there? He says two ways. He says, honor the Lord with your possessions and the first fruit of your increase so that you can be what God's called you to be. So that there's a reason. If you ever notice something about God, he'll never tell you to do something without showing you a corresponding blessing that goes with it when you do it. In other words, he tells you to do something, doesn't he? And then he says, here's the reason why I want you to do it. Not because I need your money, because you need to be blessed and God wants to bless you. God wants to take you to a new level financially. God wants to bless your home, your family. I mean, is there any one of us in here that hasn't ever said to God, God, I could use a little bit more. I could use a little bit more. And oftentimes we forget these two verses are working together and they're wonderful verses that describe literally what's taking place. I have a couple of questions. I'll put them up on the overhead. Number one, what does money have to do with our hearts? Have you ever thought about that? Someone makes a statement. He says, this is really not about money. It's really about your heart. Now watch this. What What an interesting question. What does money have to do with your hearts? Before I go any further, I want to talk to some of you today. You need to wake up. Your future is at stake. This is some of the wisest scripture you will ever get. And some of you are daydreaming on me right now. And I'm not going to let you get away with that. Because then you're going to come back to God and blame God down the road and say, God, what happened? How come they get blessed? I don't. How come the doors are open for them and they're not for me? How come they have favor with everybody and I don't? And there's a simple principle that's involved with this. So how does this money have to do with our heart? Second question is kind of fun. Why should the church even be preaching about such a thing? Why should the church teach it? Why should we even talk about this? How many times do you go to church and the preacher says, starts to talk about money and there's people in the audience that say, why do we have to talk about money? Why does a church have to do that? I wish I could go to a church that doesn't talk about money. And the problem is not the money. The problem is the issue of the heart. Let me explain because I have an answer for both of those questions by showing you something that is an emphasis, if you will, a priority of the Bible. Let me show you an example of what I'm saying. Don't you think baptism is very important? Did you know there are 40 verses in the Bible, not one, not two, not 10, not 20, 40 verses in the Bible that talk about baptism. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. I mean, how many times have we talked about these subjects? Did you know that prayer, how many of you believe prayer is important, that God wants us to pray? All of us do. It's a very important subject, right? Did you know there are 275 verses on prayer in the Bible? 200, not 10, not 20, not 50, not 100, 275 verses in the Bible showing the priority of how important this is. How many of you know uh, certainly about faith? 
Faith is subject. The Bible makes it very clear. There's no other way to please God but by faith. Do you know how many verses in the Bible talk about faith? Did you know there were 350 verses in the Bible that talk about faith? My goodness. How about, I know, love. That's got to be from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. That's what this is really all about. The most important subject maybe of the whole entire Bible certainly has got to be love. Did you know there's 650 verses that talk about love in the Bible? Not two, not 10, not 100, 200, or 300, not 400 or 500. Wow, 650 verses in the Bible. We're asking ourselves a question. Why should the church preach this? Well, you're asking ourselves a question. Why do we need to hear about this? What has our heart got to do with money? Did you know in the Bible that God talks, Old Testament and New Testament, about material wealth, finances, and material gain, possessions, 2,000 350 times. More than all the rest combined. You say, why? Is God after my money? The answer to that is no. God is after your heart. And this is always a heart issue that our hearts oftentimes are attached to what we have more than to who he is. And because he uses that as an example, because we're oftentimes, and you know it, more attached to what we have in our pocket than who is sitting supposedly in our hearts. And because it's a heart thing, and that's why this how it connects to our finances, because it's a heart thing, we don't realize it. And that's why God talks about material possessions and materialism and money. 2,350 times because we as humans always attach who we are, what we are, our identity to, our security for the future based on what we have instead of who he is. And may I say this to you, that in itself is idolatry. And that's why this is always should be taught by the church. If it's a priority of the Bible, don't you think a church ought to be bold enough to teach it to the people of God so they understand it? Now here's the problem. They don't, and the reason they don't, here's why. Listen, the reason they don't is because they're afraid of you. But see, can I just say this to you? Next year I'm 70 years old. I'm not afraid of you. I'm afraid of him. And so, uh, are you following me? And, and I'm going to stand before him sooner than most of you. And I'm fully aware of that. And that's why we need to be wise enough to realize if this is a priority of the Bible, then we need to pay attention so that we don't fall into the trap of having our hearts set on stuff and who we are based on stuff instead of who we are based on him. He doesn't mind you having the stuff. He doesn't want the stuff to have you. Is anybody listening to me? Come on, somebody. 15% of everything Jesus talked about in the New Testament, get this, 15% of everything Jesus talked about in the New Testament had to do with material possessions, possessions, and or money. 15%. 88 times in the book of Matthew. 54 times in the book of Mark. 92 times in the book of Luke. Does God need your money? The answer to that, of course, is no. But what God needs is your heart totally. And oftentimes our heart easily gets attached to who we are because of finances instead of who he is because of his blood. And it's very important that we understand this. Number one, you're going to have to see something about who you are and what you have. Everything you have, God gave you. 
It all belongs to God. You say, wait a minute, I went in school and I got an education and I'm working hard and I got a paycheck at the end and I got that degree and I got that job and I fight for it and I work hard for it and I say, great, congratulations. But if it wasn't for God, you wouldn't have gone to school, you wouldn't have had the breath to breathe, you wouldn't have had anything and you wouldn't get anything because it's all his. And I happen to know people who've got great degrees that don't do anything. And God opens a door for you. It's very important for you to see that it literally all belongs to him. If I could do this, I want to share with you out of Psalms 24. In the Old Testament, the word of God says it like this, Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. There's no doubt about it. Who owns it all? And he gives it to you. Then secondly, in the New Testament, you know, the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. In other words, you can't come up with a doctrine or a teaching about the New Testament without having a corresponding verses somewhere else in the Bible so that you can not go off crazy. You've got to make sure that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything's established. So the Old Testament makes it very clear that it all belongs to God. Now watch the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10 chapter. Verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Same thing. It all belongs to God. Now here's how this works. And if you're interested in having any increase in your future, remember the verse number 10 that says God wants your barns filled and your vats filled to overflowing? Come on. If you're interested in that part of the verse, then you've got to be interested in the other part of the verse that you honor the Lord with all of your possessions. Now, if you're interested in having your vats filled and your barns filled, you need to listen. You are a manager, a steward, if you will, of what God gives you. Let me make that very clear. You are a manager, you are a steward of what God gives gives you. You say, you may feel like, I worked really hard for this, yeah, but guess what? God gave you the energy. God gave it all to you in order for you to have the favor to even get it. So you may have worked hard for it, and that's a principle in the Bible that you will work hard and get it, but it's still God that gave it to you. And you are a steward of what God gives it to you. Now watch these words, so important for you to understand, because without it, you, you'll miss everything. How you manage determines how much you manage. According to the scripture, and I'll show it to you in a moment, you got to get this, how you manage determines how much you manage. Deborah and I have lived our entire life on this. Knowing that God, whatever it was that he gave us, and may I say this to you, there's at times he gave us very little and we had nothing. And then there's times of great blessing. Had to manage what it was, either little or great, with the idea that whoever it is that gave it to us. So he's the owner of everything. He's the one that owns it all. He gives to you. And how you manage it determines how much He's going to give back to you. Let me give you an illustration. Let me, can I tell you an illustration? If I had a stockbroker and I was the owner of the money and I said, I want you to buy so-and-so stocks for me. And the guy says, well, okay, great, I'll do that. Takes my money and he goes buy some other stock and he loses everything. Can you imagine me going back to him and saying, wow, you lost everything. Please let me give you some more. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. You'll find that, in fact, you'll find in Matthew 25th chapter, it's kind of interesting. In Matthew 25th chapter, you find the, the uh, uh, parable uh, of the good steward or the talents. And God, remember the story, gives five to one person. Two to another. Verse 15, if you wanted to read that. And then uh, gives one to another person. So here's, I was always mad about that because God gave somebody five pieces of money, gave another two, and, and the example is the, the, the rich man, or God, gave one to this other guy. I said, man, that's 
prejudice. That's wrong. That's not very fair. God doesn't work on what's fair. God works on what's right and just. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. And that verse says, it was given to them according to their ability. If they had ability to manage the five, they got five more. If they had ability to manage the two, they'll get two more. If they don't have the ability to even manage the one, they get nothing. And that one will be taken from them and given not to the guy who had two and now has four, but to the guy who had five and now has ten. Why? Because the guy that has five has ten. Is his ability is greater than the one that has two. God's looking for somebody to take what he gives us. He is the owner and manage it correctly. Correctly is not what you think. Correctly is not what I think. Correctly is the owner's thoughts. And what he says, anybody listening? Now, with that in mind, go with me if you will, please. Luke 16th chapter. In Luke 16th chapter, he says these words, y'all write them down, they're pretty powerful. He who is faithful, I, I, you see how I highlighted the word faithful? But the most powerful words there is he who is. Did you know that he who is includes you? He didn't say a certain person. He didn't say that guy, the educated guy, or the smart guy, or the guy that has degrees, the guy that has a great job, the guy that has uh, this and that, the guy that's talented, the guy that's gifted. didn't say that. He said these words, the most powerful words you'll ever get, because he's talking about anybody. He says, he who is. That means that includes you and me. And the word faithful comes in there. And the word faithful is an interesting word. In the word faithful, there's a connotation that means faithful is not just faithful in good times, but faithful during a time of pressure, which Pastor Luke was talking about last week. In other words, faithful is tested during a time of pressure. It's easy. Anybody know it's easy to be faithful when things are going good? But it is real difficult in a time of pressure. I love my wife. I'm a faithful husband. I'm faithful, yes, because I love her. But I'm also faithful in when there's outside circumstances that put pressure. If something else like my wife comes along, I don't look, I don't go there, I don't talk, I don't even get into a conversation about that. That's not anything I'm going to do. When the pressure comes from the outside, then my faithfulness is tested. Is anybody listening? So in that word faithful is a connotation that comes along and says, during a time of pressure, you remain faithful. And he says, faithful in what is least is faithful in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in much. In other words, he just made a statement. He says, if you can't handle the little things and be faithful with the little bit you have. Remember how you always say, God, if you give it to me, I'll give you more. Not true. Not true. So many times people come along and say, God, if you'll just let me win the lottery, I'll give 90% of it to the church. Not 10, 90. Not true. You haven't even given 10 when you had a dollar. And God's not stupid. Are you following me? And he says these words. He makes a statement. He says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful, is faithful in much. In other words, I can trust you. If you, if you handle the little, then I'm going to give you more. Remember this? And then you can handle the more. But then he says this. He who is unjust. You know what unjust means? First of all, you've got to know what's just. What's just is not what you feel, what your wallet says, or what your checkbook says. What's just is not what the world claims. What's just is what God says. What's just, let me say it again, is what God says. And we live in a whole world based on our feelings, our wants, and what is right and what is wrong, what is fair and what isn't fair. None of that makes a difference to God whatsoever because what is unjust is when you get something that you know is, belongs to him and you treat it your way, you are now unjust to the justice that he gave you. In his just way, he gave it to you. He says, here's what to do with it. And you said, you're the stockbroker that said, I'll do what I want with it. 
And he says, if you're unjust, in other words, you're no longer operating in the justice, what God says, then you're unjust, and if you're unjust a little, you'll be unjust the most. Verse number 11 comes along and makes this statement. Therefore, if you're not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. Remember the word mammon last week? Pastor Luke talked to us. The word mammon means what? Money. You just put it right in your Bible, right alongside it, money. And what is money? Unrighteous. Unrighteous. Why is it unrighteous? Because, guys, listen to what I'm going to say to you. It doesn't di dictate anything. All it does is get you and going in the wrong direction in your heart. It can become a God to you. That you listen to it, you operate your life by it, you are conditioned by it, you make decisions that are unjust, which means contrary to the ways of justice. And you make decisions contrary to the ways of justice, all by, guess what? Because that became your God, mammon. Therefore, if you've been unfaithful and unrighteous, mammon, who will commit to you and trust the true riches? Verse number 12 says it like this. Listen to this, verse 12. Remember, we're talking about you're the manager. As well as you manage, what you have will determine what you have in the future. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man. See the word other man? Who's the other man? God. He owns it all. And if you have not been faithful in what God has, who will give you your own? Because, verse 13 brings us right back to last week, no servant can serve two masters. He either will hate the one and love the other, or whether he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other, you cannot serve God and the master money. So this is not about money, it's about your heart. And it's about when God, the other person, God who owns it all, gives it to you, what do you do with it? Do you do what you want, which is unjust, contrary to the ways of God, or do you do what the master wants? And all of that determines whether or not what you're going to amount to and as far as what you manage. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to share some verses with you because I'm going to share with you quickly how to build your own financial portfolio. That's pretty cool. Well, I, maybe I'll just forget it. No. Nah, you don't care what the Bible says about building your financial portfolio, do you? Yeah. Maybe we just ought to forget that part. That was pretty good right there. Let's just quit there. See, I want to take you further in this. because Why? Because God cares about your finances. Why? He wants your barns filled and he wants your vats filled. Okay, if he wants my barns and vats filled, then I'm going to have to learn how to do this. I'm going to have to learn how to manage, not in an unjust way, which means contrary to the ways of God, but I need to learn how to manage it con to, to the ways of God, which makes me just, even in the little things so that I can get the more. Is anybody listening? Okay, no, wait a minute. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to go fast, but I'm going to make this statement. you got to hear this. And earlier I said this, put your money where your mouth is. That's what he was saying. You remember that? God's not stupid. He understands this. With Deborah's permission, I asked her today if it was all right if I could share this. And I'm not sharing this to brag because you walk out of here and say, oh, that's offensive to me. That's your problem because I'm telling you up front, I'm not bragging. I'm sharing this in two methods. One, the word of God, and two, Deborah and I live what I'm sharing. Are you following me? Deborah and I have lived this all of our life. All of our life. When we're broke and down, when we're wealthy and rich. We've lived it all. We've lived it all. We believe so much in freedom of the future. We are the biggest givers to freedom of the future. I'm saying this as a ex living example, not as a bragging relationship, so that you can see I put my money where my mouth is. Over the years, Deborah and I consistently, year after year, almost every year, have been the biggest givers of this church, at least in the top three, but almost every year the biggest givers. 
Our pledge to freedom of the future was hundreds of thousands of dollars. We don't know where it's coming from, but we know it's coming. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. The closest pledge to us was about one-third of that amount. One-third. I believe this so much that I put my life on the line as a senior citizen. When, you know, when you get old, you better grab every buck you can because there's a time when you can't make any money and you can't earn any money. And yet, I believe in what you're going to learn in the next few minutes so much that we put our money where our mouth is. And we did this, and I want you to know, purely I'm telling you as an example, so you do not have a preacher standing in front of you telling you something like this and doesn't do it himself. Year after year for 26 years. And that's why Deborah and I are incredibly prosperous today. Incredibly, in every area of our life. 1 Corinthians, let's go to the, some principles. I'll point them out to you as we go. You should write them down. The fifth chapter. Here we find Paul writing to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is a very wealthy church. They don't want to give much money. They're tight wads. Their hearts are stuck in their materialism instead of in the things of God. And he writes to them. They have made a pledge to the poor, but like a lot of people that make pledges, they don't follow through, so he is doing something. He's writing to the Corinthian church. What he wrote became really the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for all of us today, so this is really God speaking to us about principles. He makes this statement, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your gift. Here's the deal. In other words, on June 21st to June 22nd is a day of celebration and us bringing our hearts before the Lord. And just like they went before time, they're encouraging the people to bring their gift. But you read it the wrong way. Let's read it the right way. Notice what it says. He says, and prepare your gift. Does your Bible say that? It does not say that. Notice the emphasis here. Is prepare your what? Generous gift. Generosity is something that doesn't come from the wallet. Generosity doesn't come from the checkbook. Generosity doesn't come from the balance. Generosity doesn't come because you're a good accountant with your finances and have a little extra. Generosity is a product of the heart that comes from the heart. It's something you feel when you give. And that's what he's talking about, is a gift that comes not from the wallet, because anybody can do that, or an accounting process, because anybody can do that, but comes from the heart. A generous gift before in which you previously promised, last part of that verse. That it may be ready as a matter of, again, generosity. In other words, I'm preparing you to do something. That you would come and bring a gift from your heart. Not as a grudging obligation. In other words, it's not something you have to do because everybody else is doing it. You have to do it because some preacher told you to do it. You have to do it because they made crazy promises that the money's going to fall out of every place. You're going to be rich. What a bunch of baloney. Can I tell you something? You can give everything you have, give it the wrong way and get nothing returned from God. Somebody needs to tell you that. Instead of saying, you just give, give, give. That's not what this is about. Giving comes from a heart. 
Because if giving doesn't come from a heart, then what happens is giving now comes out of religious, ceremonial, ritual, and traditions of men, and it stops the Spirit of God from working on your behalf. Verse number six. But I say, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, right after he makes this statement about a generous gift and generously doing this unto God, he now says, whatever you sow, you'll reap. You sow a little, you'll reap a little. You sow a lot, you'll reap a lot. In other words, God never tells you to give without coming right behind telling you how you're going to receive. He never says give, and for, of course, our hearts, if it's right, is God, if I receive, fine. If I don't receive, I don't care, because I'm in love with you. But man, every time God encourages us to give, right behind his encouragement to give, like you just saw, next verse, bang, what you sow, you reap. If you sow a little, you reap a little. If you sow a lot, right back to Genesis, what you sow, you reap. Right back to Genesis, the first chapter, everything produces after its own kind. If I have an apple seed, I put it in the ground, I can't expect corn. If I have an apple seed, put it in the ground, I'm not expecting lettuce. If I have an apple seed, put it in the ground, I'm not expecting an orange. If I have an apple seed, everything produces after its own kind. Guess what? If I put an apple seed in the ground, guess what I'm getting? The law of Genesis says I'm getting what? An apple. And that's the way it is. And whatever you sow, reap. Bountifully. Verse number seven. And let each one of us give as he purposes in his wallet. In his checking account statement. In his bank account statement. See, let me tell you the truth. In the New Testament, All tithing requirements were fulfilled by Jesus on the cross at Calvary. But a new requirement comes, and it's a requirement of all of your heart. So it's really not a 10%. It's really whatever's in your heart. Now listen to this. If you give 5% from your heart, it's better than you giving 30% out of tradition. Did you hear that? You're never going to hear a preacher tell you that in a hundred years. If you give 5% from your heart, it's better than giving 30% out of ceremonial ritual. Because it's not about giving out of ritual. It's about giving out of generosity from the heart. And he makes this statement, let every man give according. Listen to these words. He purposes as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly out of necessity. Don't give because some preachers tell you we're going down if we don't get some money. You give because you're in love with God and you want to see the kingdom expanded and you want to take what he gives you and operate in a just way with it, not an unjust. Unjust is doing it your way, just is doing it his way. Watch this. For God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, he's coming to people saying, you're going to be giving, I want you cheerful in your giving. The one translation says hilarious. That giving is an excitement, something I felt, something I want to do. You can't hold me back. You can't stop me. You, I, I got to give. You know, listen, you, can, you, can, you cannot love God and not want to give. And it's all about the heart. And that's where we miss this. Verse number 8 comes along. Remember verse 8? For God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have an all sufficiency in all things, and have nothing. You're broke down, busted, and disgusted. And you'll have never have enough. Why? It's a replenishable resource. When you give it, God gives it back. You've got more. Then you get more, you get more, you get more, you get more. You give more, you get more, you give more, you get more. It's a replenishable resource. Sometimes we think of money as it's not a replenishable resource. What Debbie and I gave out of sacrificial giving from the depths of our hearts 15, 10, 12 years ago, we don't even remember what it was today. But it was done then. 
for that moment as God directed us. And God has blessed us ever since. Let me tell you something. I never missed a meal. You can tell by my belly. <laughs> Abundance of good work. Isn't that a wonderful verse? Today, this is not a message on finances. This is a message on your heart. This is a message on doing what you have, as little as it is, or as great as it is, because you want to, because you love him, and you trust him, and you know he'll take care of you. But even if he didn't, which he will, it'd be okay. I'd much rather go broke doing something from, for God then be safe and secure and never have done anything for God. Today, here's what you learn. Number one, it's about the heart. It's not about your money. Number two, it's all God's anyway. Number three, we are managers and how well we manage determines how much we manage. Number four, the church needs to exhort you in this. Because at times we forget no matter how much we know it. Number five, we need to bring a gift? No, just a generous gift that comes from the heart, not just from the numbers of our wallet. Number six, God will bless you back. He always finishes up his requirements for us with a blessing back to us. He's a good God. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Will you do that? Luke, you have... Two minutes, man. <laughs> You've come into the house of God. You sang songs. You worshiped the Lord. You were great hearing the word of God. Wouldn't it be a tragedy? Wouldn't it be a tragedy? Listen to me. If you left this place today, on your way to your car, your heart stopped and bang, you're dead. Where would you open your eyes? In heaven or hell. And don't give me this, you don't believe in hell. I could care less whether you believe in hell. God does, he talks about it. It's a real place and just because you don't believe in it doesn't make it go away. Where would you open your eyes? In heaven or hell? Now, what makes you think you're gonna make it? Because there's nowhere in the Bible that says you can make it to heaven because you're good. Nowhere in the Bible that says you get to go to heaven because you're nice. Nowhere in the Bible it says because your mom and dad told you you were Christian, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible it's because you were christened or baptized as a baby, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible it says because you finished catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class, you get to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you joined the church, you get to go to heaven. Nowhere. Jesus makes a statement, you must be born again. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. You must be born again. Most people don't know what that means. They just hate the words born again. You know why you hate the words born again? Because Hollywood has literally manipulated your mind and your heart. They've made movies about crazy, fanatical, born again people that are goofy. And I want you to know something. That's not what the Bible is talking about. And Hollywood has no concept of God or heaven whatsoever. And today is your day of salvation. God brought you here for a reason. In order for you to get to heaven, you must be born again. Let me define for you from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible what born again means. Here it is that you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. Listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. It always will be. All or nothing. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. You've heard about this. He says, I'm coming again and you know he is, but you don't know when and neither do I. He says, but when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. And that's a crude, rude statement. We have a real hard concept in our minds that Jesus never said anything that was offensive or bad to anybody. But man, that is a rude, crude statement. And Jesus makes it himself very serious. 
I'll vomit you from my mouth. You know what he just really said? People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. What's lukewarm? Let's define it. Little in, little out, little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, lukewarm. You know, you go to church once in a while, but you know, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. Lukewarm, let's talk about it. You know, that's where he is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just along with all the other things that are in your life. That's lukewarm. Today you can change that by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth and stop playing religious games, but tell you like it is. And I love you enough and respect you enough to tell you you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to give God all of your heart and all of your life. He's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to manipulate you out of it. It's your call and your choice, and no one can make that but you. It's your choice to give God all of your heart and all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. Simple as that. You can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. I want to be born again. I want to be a child of God. I don't want to go to hell. I'll see your hand go up. Listen to me, it's all you have to do. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, if you want me to raise my hand, you want me to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you might be embarrassed, but it's better to be embarrassed in this safe place than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that stupid, but the devil thinks you're stupid and he's trying to talk you out of not raising your hand right now when you know deep down in your heart you need to. Today is your day of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Going in the wrong direction, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. I'm speaking to you. I'm, I've done my job. I'm gonna tell you like it is. I'm counting to three right now. I'm preparing you to do it. Get ready. Here it is. One, two, Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, thank you, back in the family, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, thank you. Back over on this side, 31, is there anybody back here? I, 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 what, all, all the sinners sat on this side today. 31, where are you, 32 and 33? Just a bunch of liars. Maybe you're all saved. God bless you. I hope you are. 32, 33. Thank you. 34 outside in the foyer. God bless you. Thank you in the foyer. Let's stand and give the Lord a great big praise. All 33 of you, if you raise your hand, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a friend and come up here right now. We're going to pray with you. As I dismiss the people, don't leave yet. If you raise your hand, okay, stop clapping. You're making too much noise. If you raise your hand and you're serious about God, if you raise your hand, get out of your seat. If you didn't raise your hand, you know you need to raise your hand. Get out of your seat. Get up here right now. Come on, hurry. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Come on, come on, come on, come on. What shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee. Come on, home. Come on, home. Just as I am without one plea. God, 
is so good. All right, all of you in front, listen to me. I'm going to give you instructions. Everybody look to your left. See this guy waving at you? Wave big. What's that little sissy wave? That's better. Uh, big wave. And here's this really good guy, Pastor Joe. He's a good guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff, and show you a program we have to help you keep strong in Jesus. We don't want you to fall through the cracks. We want to help you go on with Jesus. He'll tell you all about that. Only takes a few moments. Uh, people who came with, they'll wait for you. I promise they'll wait for you. If they don't, I'll personally drive you home. Is that okay? It's okay. You have to wait a few hours, but uh, you know, make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joe right over there. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.